This is a production of Cornell University. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce Kirsten Kurtz, who was presenting her master's thesis research this morning. Kirsten has a unique background, which has provided her with a perfect combination of knowledge and skills for her current career. Kirsten had a family background in farming and has worked in a diversity of farming businesses, including co-owning an organic farm in Hector, New York. However, she has always loved art and explored this career option during her undergraduate years, completing her BA in painting and fine arts at SUNY Empire State College. She returned to her roots when she began working for the Cornell Soil Health Laboratory in 2012. She has continued expanding her responsibilities and now serves as the laboratory manager. In this capacity, she oversees six to 14 technici technicians and the processing of about 5,000 soil samples annually. She has played key roles in developing the methodologies, quality control, and quarantine procedures for the soil health analyses. Kirsten simultaneously maintains the website, the social media, and the branding for the laboratory. She has combined her love of painting and soils and pioneered a unique approach to soil painting. This approach has formed the basis for the UN Global Soil Painting Competition and 2015 World Soil Day. She uses soil painting as a medium for outreach on soil health and is much sought after as a presenter on both soil health and soil painting. You can see some of her work on permanent display in Bradfield Hall. She started her graduate, graduate work in the fall of 2017, and we are excited that she is presenting and defending her thesis today. The title of her thesis is Using the Comprehensive Assessment of Soil Health of Remnant Tall Grass Prairies as a Benchmark Reference for Restoration of Degraded Agricultural Systems. Uh, thank you all so much for coming to join me this morning. I am honored and thrilled to be sharing the results of my MS research. Um, we're going to have about five minutes at the end of the talk for questions, but if any of you guys want to ask me specific questions and get into the nitty gritty, I have my email here on the screen. Okay, so human induced soil degradation um, is a really big deal. It's costing about 8 billion to the global GDP. This has been recently estimated. And it has five major causes. Uh, the first of which is deforestation and the removal of natural vegetation. The next is overgrazing, overexploitation of vegetation for domestic use, um, industrial and bio-industrial activities, and agricultural activities, which is what I'm gonna primarily be talking about today and I'm talking about unsustainable agricultural activities. So most of the agriculture in the world is on former grasslands. Grasslands used to cover 33.7% of the land surface of the planet. And I included this picture to give everyone an idea of just the diversity of grasslands and also the sheer number of space that they used to take up across the American Midwest to the West Coast. So as mentioned, most of these have been converted to row crops by that, I mean, corn, soy, things along those lines. And because of that, they're really essential for food security. They're also hot spots of biodiversity. So they're some of the most biodiverse areas in the world. And I'm talking about plant species, insect species, microbial community species, extremely um, biodiverse. And big picture, they're estimated to hold 10 to 30% of the world's global carbon stock. This is a huge number. And this really talks to the overarching importance of grasslands to us all. Um, so the conversion of the great American prairie to agriculture really began, in my opinion, with the advent of the plow. This was invented in 1837, and this was essential for breaking up the American prairies. Prairies are actually, soils are very dense. I was really surprised by this when Rebecca and I went out to sample. Um, this is mostly because of all of the roots just stretching throughout the system. And then in 1862, um, the Homestead Act came into play, 
which granted 160 acres to some US citizens. And this was really the beginning of the great kind of migration out to break the American prairie. Famously in the 1930s is when we kind of came into the Dust Bowl. So the Dust Bowl impacted 40 million hectares. And of the states that were affected, it's estimated that 75% of the topsoil is gone just with that one big event. Um, this is generally accepted as the major cause of the Great Depression. And I had to share here just one picture, this painting that I found um, that was painted during the Dust Bowl by Alexander Hogue. And I think that this really um, captures just sort of the, the destitute attitude that must have been um, during that time. And then I'd also like to draw your attention to this photograph that was taken in 2011. And this is of a dust storm coming across um, Arizona. So this is something that is still happening to this day, these big dust storms. So conventional agriculture, um, the erosion rate has been estimated by Raton Lal at 1.53 millimeters a year. And by conventional agriculture, I mean agriculture that isn't using soil health building principles like crop rotation, um, cover crops, things along those lines. And then when we look at conservation agriculture, we see that those erosion rates are much, much lower at 0.082 millimeters a year. And you know, the conservation is taking in these more sustainable practices. And then these are both um, quite drastic numbers when we look against the average soil formation rates in the, on the planet, which are 0.017 millimeters a year. So basically we're building soil up much more slowly than we're eroding it, even under healthy systems. So part of these grasslands, the uh, easternmost part of these grasslands is the tall grass prairie. And this map that you see here on the screen in light green, this is the original extent of the tall grass prairie. And in dark green, we see what is left as remnants or undisturbed prairie. So this is a Nature Conservancy map from 2010. I will tell you that we've lost a lot of these prairies since then. And I wanna stop for a moment and define what a remnant prairie is. So for our purposes and the purposes of my research, a remnant prairie soil is a soil that has not been cultivated or tilled by modern agriculture. So I mean, since the advent of modern agriculture, it hasn't been farmed. It's important to note that it has been managed. Most of these remnants are managed by people like the Nature Conservancy or Nebraska's Game and Parks Organization. And um, they do prescribed burning. They do some tree removal, specifically cedars. And um, they also do some grazing. And this is really actually essential to preserve the prairies because otherwise you're gonna have tree encroachment um, like you can see in this picture I have included here on the screen. This is us driving up to one of the remnant prairies and you can see the trees really do want to, to creep into that ecosystem. All right, so this kind of brings me to our research objectives. So we were really interested in evaluating and quantifying the soil health of these remnant tall grass prairies in Nebraska using a suite of physical, biological, and chemical soil health analysis tests. We are also interested in comparing these data with active agricultural sites that were directly adjacent or in very close proximity to these remnant prairies. And then finally, we are interested in comparing both of those results with um, the Cornell Soil Health Database on prairie state soils. So um, we were, and we were, I'm gonna discuss how we were able to do that. All right, so I wanna stop and talk for a second about benchmark or comparison or goal-oriented sampling. Um, we say often in the lab when you're approaching sampling and sampling strategy, you should really have a good question. 
So because you can learn so much more from comparing two samples to each other than you can from one sample just kind of floating out there in space, right? So I'll point out this sort of little map in the beginning, which lays out the sampling strategy. And in this case, we would be looking at no-till versus plow-till. And we would go out and we would sample in a W-shaped pattern across our area of interest. And we would be avoiding any spots that looked like they had like really vigorous growth. And we'd also be avoiding any spots that looked like it had really poor growth. So basically we're looking for a representation of what's actually out in the field. And our study sites were along the eastern side of Nebraska. And I put some stars here that you can see the approximate locations of these sites. And we were able to identify five remnant prairie sites. We found these through Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, as well as through some literature review and some scientists who had done research on these tall grass prairie microbial communities specifically. Um, and then we were able to identify active agricultural sites that were either adjacent or in very close proximity, as I mentioned. Now, all of these ag sites had a corn soy rotation. None of them were using cover crops. Um, and we also determined that all of the sites had a similar soil type, they had a similar slope, they had a sim similar geographic um, location. They're all less derived mollusols. And, um, you know, we kind of made those decisions before we even went out there to be sure that these really would be valid comparisons. All right, so then at each site, we went out and we collected five samples um, in the method that I had mentioned a few slides prior. And those samples were taken about 25 meters apart, which is the way that's been standardized for, by the Cornell Soil Health Lab. And we took a single zero to 30 centimeter sample. And you can see here on this picture, that's exactly what they look like. We kind of did the slice of bread technique. Um, again, from the Cornell Soil Health Lab. And then we manually measured and divided it into a zero to 15 centimeter sample and a 15 to 30 centimeter sample. So each location resulted in 10 soil samples. And then total, we ended up with 90 soil samples. All right, so here feels like a good place to introduce the lab. So of course I am the manager of the Cornell Soil Health Lab. I've been working with the lab for almost 10 years. In a couple of months here, it'll be 10 years. Um, so it was really an obvious choice for a comprehensive way to look at these soils. So the lab opened in 2007. It was the first commercially available soil health test. Um, we've analyzed well over 10,000 samples from around the world. We hold, to my knowledge, the world's largest global soil health database. Excuse me. And we're currently working on regional soil health databases. So by that, I mean, we're starting to separate it into different areas and look at soil health for Nebraska, for instance, um, which is very exciting. Okay, so within the lab, we have the Comprehensive Assessment of Soil Health, the CASH test, which is basically what we used um, to analyze these soils. And I'm gonna briefly just go through uh, what we looked at and sort of what it means. I'm not gonna talk about our laboratory um, processes, although I easily could if you guys have questions about it. All right, so we looked at the biological, we looked at quite a suite of biological factors, including organic matter, which is quite simply carbon containing material derived from living organisms. And we looked at the percentage of this organic matter. We also looked at soil protein, which is a way to get at the organically bound nitrogen in the soil organic matter. We looked at soil respiration, which is a measure of the metabolic activity of the soil microbial community. We looked at active carbon, which is 
basically of the portion of organic matter that's easily available for the microbial community as a food and energy source. We looked at total carbon, which includes organic carbon and inorganic carbon. And we looked at total nitrogen, which is the same idea looking at organic and inorganic nitrogen. We also looked at um, a few physical parameters, texture, which is quite simply the percentage of sand, silt, and clay, and aggregate stability. So aggregates are basically those little crumbs of soil you can kind of see in this picture here in the middle. And they're held together by um, the hyphae and by that microbial community that really helps to make them more stable. And the way that we look at it is what percentage are stable under a rain simulation. And then of course, we also looked at pH, the major nutrients and the minor nutrients. All right, so if you were to submit a sample to our lab, you would receive a report from us, the front page of which is all the way on the left-hand side of the screen. And I just wanna point out that this is divided into physical and purple, green, biological and chemical um, aspects of your soil. And then I'll draw your attention to the rating kind of in the middle of the report there. And you can see that we use a color coded rating system. So basically what this is, is dark green means you're in the top 20% of everything we've received in the lab, very much on the high end. The red is that you're in the bottom 20%, so you've got some major issues going on, and then you can see how the rainbow kind of works in between. And this is really all based off of or interpreted using the textural triangle, which I've put here on this screen as well. So your soil texture is going to have a lot to do with the potential of your soil. So um, if you look here on our scoring function graph, in the solid line, you can see the coarse textured soil, that would be a sand. The um, dot and dash line in the middle, that's a medium textured soil, that's a silt loam, something like that, which is what our samples were and what I'm gonna be talking about today. And then the dashed lines are the fine textured soil, which is a clay soil. All right, so now I wanna move big picture into some results. Um, this is composited data for all of our sites. And what I did is I took um, the, the scoring curve and the colors and I actually superimposed them over onto the box plots because I wanted to really easily visually show where our samples were falling in against um, the average of what we received in the lab. So in the light blue, that, are, that is the ag samples. The dark blue is the remnant prairie soils. And you can see that the organic matter in this case in the ag soils is actually not that bad. It's in the light green, kind of up there towards 4%, a little over at some points. But then when we look at the remnant prairie, we see it's well up into the dark green, stretching all the way up above 7% in one or two cases. So this is um, right off the bat, a pretty good takeaway as to the differences among these soils. Moving into active carbon, this is another biological result. We saw the most pronounced differences in the biological results. Um, we can see the active carbon here. So again, this is kind of that quality of organic matter, um, that food source for the microbes. And we see that in the ag, it's in the light green and stretching into the yellow, so kind of average-ish. Whereas when we look at the remnant prairie, we see it's almost like topping it out. So if you look at our chart, you know, it kind of tops out at 1200. It's all super dark green over there at the 900 parts per million. So we have very high active carbon in these remnant prairies. We saw a very similar, um, pattern in the respiration, whereas, um, which is the, uh, an indicator of the functioning of that microbial community, the activity of the mi microbial community. And this is a lot more dramatic in that we see the ag is down there in the orange and yellow. So orange, typically in our lab, if someone 
had orange or red results, I would say you've got pretty serious issues that you need to start paying attention to. So we're starting to really see some of this degradation in the ag soil when we're looking at this respiration. And then of course, looking at the prairie, again, it's full on dark green. It's really looking quite good um, and high. So I had mentioned that we, um, have paired samples. So I wanted to just take one slide to give you all an idea of what this looks like. So what I did is with these kind of checked lines here, I divided um, the different paired samples. So I think you'll see one ag, one P, those samples went together, two ag, two P, those ones went together, so forth. All the way on the right hand side of that box plot, you'll see that we actually have one ag site and two remnant prairies kind of confusing, but it was like, you know, if you get offered another remnant prairie, you're just gonna sample it while you're there. You know, it just makes sense. And then of course, I also, again, superimposed the color coding system because these aggregate stability results are really, in my opinion, quite extreme. So I wanna point out um, that first one ag and one P, I was looking back through my notes last night and according to the farmer um, that I talked to, they started farming in 1967. So remnant prairie. So this is the amount of difference that we can assume has happened since 1967. As we learned from earlier slides, most of the American prairie was broken way, way, way before that. So we can see that probably in the case of the four ag, for instance, you know, that there's been a lot more time for this soil to really degrade. All right, so then we also did some kind of like really big picture stats. We looked at the Pearson's correlation coefficient. One of the big takeaways from this is that the organic matter and the organic matter quality indicators show the highest correlation. So I went ahead on my color coding track and I highlighted everything that was above 0.70 as being a very strong positive relationship as well as everything in the 0.40 to 0.69 um, with the lighter green just to give you guys kind of visually a quick uh, look at what these um, relationships really looked like. So we can see um, a very strong correlations between carbon content and that microbial community. We also see um, increases with the organic matter conducive to accumulations of available potassium and the total and available nitrogen. Um, this all makes sense. Um, we also see a little bit with of correlations and strong relationships with the magnesium. Um, again, these are associated kind of with your quality of organic matter. So to me, this whole pattern is really driven by that um, organic matter in the system. And this is looking at the ag sites and the prairie sites together. So we are also interested, of course, in um, understanding if there are differences existing um, among the sites. So we can see that the first component here drove about 33% of the variation. And this was mostly um, biological drivers like the active carbon, aggregate stability, carbon, things along those lines. And then it looks like that second component um, is really driving that separation of the ag. We think that this has a lot to do with pH. Um, the remnant prairies on average had a pH of 6.83 versus the active ag had an average pH more like six. So that's actually quite a difference. And it's unsurprising that that would be a driver of these principal um, component differences here. All right, so um, kind of the third goal was about creating a target, right? And a big part of that was about comparing our results to the results that we've gotten from the lab. So again, I've gone in here and I've color coded this according to um, the ratings that we would give in the lab. So all the way to the left, we have the Prairie State silt loams. I wanted to only compare my results against other silt loam samples. 
Um, so this is compared against 126 samples. And then in the middle, we have our agricultural sites. And then all the way to the right, we have our prairie sites. So I think that this does a few different things. One, it shows the high quality of our remnant prairie sites. They are indeed higher on all parameters than any of the other sites that we've looked at. Um, there is this glaring red in the prairie sites that we've gotten from the um, lab, and that's in phosphorus. It's really high levels of phosphorus. This is probably due to adding manure to a lot of these agricultural fields. Um, and then we do even see higher levels of phosphorus on our agricultural sites here in the middle. But what I think is really important about this is we established targets, right? So a lot of like the ecological restoration papers talk about how we have to have targets to aim towards, but they don't really exist in any kind of like realistic scale. So the whole idea is that we used this lab that's really accepted for research, it's well established, and we're using that to set up these parameters for these goals, which I think we are able to do. All right, so some key takeaway concepts. So our ag sites that we looked at in Nebraska all had really high yields. I looked up the average yields for that year. It was actually a drought year. And um, I only got reported back half of the yields, but they were way higher than what was on average for that year. So that's a big deal because we still saw really some significant degradation in these agricultural systems. We are also able to establish um, this benchmark data for that targeted restoration efforts, like I showed on this previous slide. We saw 41% lower total carbon in the ag sites when, prepared, when um, compared to the remnant prairies. That's a really, really big difference. And we're talking about these grasslands being these huge carbon sinks. Everyone's super interested in carbon right now. This is really showing us that those agricultural systems are breaking down that core, um, carbon storage. And we are able to show that indeed these remnants are very high quality and an appropriate goal. All right, and then I just wanted to touch a little bit on some like big picture applications of this data. If I were to continue working on this project, I would probably approach the farmers that we worked with and ask them if we could put in strip trials, if we could try to target some of these specific soil health properties, we know how to improve soil health. It doesn't happen quickly, but there's methods for doing it, specific cover crops, various things. And I would go in and see if we could indeed jumpstart and improve these agricultural systems. I believe that this work could serve as a model for expanding into other grassland ecosystems across the world and across the United States. This information could be applied towards the remediation of desertified grasslands. So for instance, in Ningxia, China, where Rebecca works really closely, these um, desertified grasslands used to be just like this big, this tall grass prairie soils. That's what they were, but they've been doing agriculture for way, way longer than we have been in the United States. And, you know, they've really pushed it way past just a little bit of degraded ag land to where it's actually turning into desert that they're actively working on bringing back. And finally, I think it's really important to share, to collaborate. So I believe that this information should be provided to other big soil databases and global soil databases in order to, um, to help improve in general uh, all of our work, basically. All right, with that, um, I have to say thank you so much to my committee, especially um, my chair, Rebecca Schneider, who worked with me um, very closely on all of this work, as well as Harold Van S, my boss and colleague and co-committee chair, and Stephen Moriel, also from Natural Resources. We do have an additional co-author from China, um, our work was funded by the Ningxia Forest Institute in China, as well as some of the sample analyses were funded in part by USDA NRCS Conservation Innovation Grants. So I'm super thankful for that funding. And I also have listed 
just some of the people that this work couldn't have been possible without in one way or another. Sometimes it was just through converse, inspiring conversations. Sometimes it was from like sitting down and really digging through the data. So yeah, thank you all so much for your attention and for the opportunity to pursue this education at Cornell. I really appreciate it. Great, great. You wanna um, stop sharing screen and we'll see if anybody has a question they wanna ask. And I'm gonna get my chair. <laughs> I have to stand sitting, uh, talk standing up, but I think I can answer questions sitting down. Great. Great. Anybody have any questions? We're obviously gonna be asking our questions in a few minutes, but um, in case you all had anything. Yeah, I've got a quick question here, Liz Ricci. Uh So yeah, very nice presentation, first of all. Um, but yeah, so you mentioned using these soils as benchmarks for the Midwest. Would you, what would you say would be an appropriate benchmark for somewhere else in the country, maybe the Northeast, per se? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, so there's actually remnant sites you can find in lots of different systems. Like even in New York City, there's, um, you know, these really old cemeteries. It sounds really weird, right? But there's these really, really old cemeteries like from like revolutionary war times that have these same ideas of these remnant, you know, never disturbed, never touched microbial communities, things like that. And there's other scientists who have used cemeteries. I've heard some funny stories about people getting in trouble for going and taking samples in cemeteries. But I think that you could, you know, like maybe in New York, it would probably be pretty tricky, but I do think it would be possible. Maybe even in like long-term um, like fence lines, things like that, like places that you just know like borders, right? That like no one has really messed with. Then you can go in, you can look at that against, you know, what has been manipulated. But I do think that, yeah, the concept of remnants and the concept of like goals, you know, benchmarks, is going to be a valuable way of assessing um, soil health moving forward, based on based on my reading and my work. Thanks. Okay. Well, uh, doesn't look like there's any other questions. Um, thank you all for coming, um, and Whoops. we appreciate it. Rebecca, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't get on alpha mute fast enough. I did have a question. Oh sure, go, Aaron. No problem. You don't Thanks. Mind. So. Uh, great job, Kirsten. It was good to see you and good to see everyone else. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I work a lot with extension, so mine's an extension related question, but I was wondering, given the information that you have, you have the soil health tests um, and the other information that you presented, um, how would you go about convincing a farmer to implement these practices? You know, what, what would be something that you would try to do to convince them that this was good, something good for them on their farm? and would benefit them as well as the, the rest yeah, of the world? Yeah, that's a great question also. I think that one of those last slides that was all cover, color coded where I showed like our database, I think the database and this work that's being done by like Harold and Joseph M. Seeley on moving into this regional zone, right? Because it's like, it's not really fair to say, you wanna have a target that's realistic for them right? So you're saying like, okay, this is like kind of the best possible thing for your area. And we know this is possible, right? So this is a target. So instead of saying like, oh, let's just in general, try to build your soil health. Instead, we could say, all right, we're going to try to build up your active carbon by this specific amount. You're heading towards this goal, which like, as you know, as everyone in this audience knows, it takes years to build up soil health. So this goal could take them five or 10 years. But when you start to think about like land valuation for their, you know, the people who are going to inherit this property, their children, things like that, I think that you can really sell the idea of like how important it is to at least be aiming there, you know, but it's through this target. It's through having these like realistic, specific regional goals. I think that's what, because to me, I mean, you look at that and also like simplifying it, the way that you communicate, right? Like this idea of like color coding it. So you just look at it and you're like, oh my gosh, that's like totally dark green and I'm only light green. 
Like I can do that. You know, it's like a, a positive encouragement kind of a thing. That's how I would do it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you all for coming. We'll wait for you all to leave. I'm putting uh, pause on our recording. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.